Hey, this is Norman Brannon from Antimatter Zine and Texas is the Reason, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with our first brand new episode of 2024. And it's a big one. We have Jeff Rickley of Thursday. Jeff has just released his first novel. It's called Someone Who Isn't Me. We go into a deep dive about the novel, which is great, by the way. And we cover everything else. Thursday history. No Devotion, United Nations, the Ink and Dagger Reunion, everything. This is a fantastic conversation. There's a lot of new stories that I haven't heard before, and I can't wait for you to hear it. That conversation is coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Reviews. We need Apple Podcast Reviews. Now, we're up to 166, so thank you everybody who has submitted a review. But we've got to get to 200. We've got to do it, and we've got to do it soon. Keep them coming. Spotify, we're doing great. We're up to 219. So if you listen on Apple Podcasts, open up the app, search the new scene, scroll down a little bit, and hit that five-star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it at the end of the show. Shirts. We've got shirts for sale at Death Wish Inc. Long sleeve, short sleeve, you name it, we've got it. We are sold out of large in the long sleeve shirt, but we've got every other size. Grab one before they're gone. And you can always email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. And don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Hot Water Music. The 30th anniversary tour kicks off in 2024 with Quicksand. Check their pages for a full list of dates. Rebuilder will be performing on Cruise Askew. That's the Jay and Silent Bob Cruise, which takes place February 23rd through 26th. Check Rebuilder's page for more information on that cruise. Jerome's Dream have East Coast tour dates in February. Check out their page or the Iodine page for a full list of dates. Dead Bars just released Jukebox Volume 1. This is two new cover songs that are available now, everywhere, to stream. They covered Morphine, they have covered Credence, Clearwater Revival. Go check it out. Bucket Full of Teeth, the discography, is up now and available for streaming. The pre-order is also up for the vinyl. That's four LPs covering the whole discography. And finally, Quicksand and the Iron Roses will be part of the Punk Rock Bowling Fest in Las Vegas. That's this May. Passes are on sale now. Also, don't forget to support this month's sponsor, Death Wish Inc. That's right. Death Wish Inc. is back to sponsor the new scene for the month of January. And here's some updates. The Hope Conspiracy have just surprise released their first new music in 14 years. The EP is called Confusion, Chaos, Misery. It's here and it's fantastic. Pick up some vinyl and merch today. Death Heaven, the Sunbather remaster is out. There's new vinyl, there's new merch. Go get some. Acclaimed artist Richie Beckett has a new Death Wish ink store with new merch designs. The shirts look awesome. Go pick one up. So go follow them on Instagram at Deathwish Inc. or check out the website at deathwishinc.com. All right, so listen, check back in with me in segment three. A lot has happened since the last time we checked in. I saw Piebald play a gig in Brooklyn. I saw This Will Destroy You last night. They played a gig in Manhattan. It's New Year's Day. There's a lot going on. There is a lot for us to catch up with. But right now, we are going to speak to Jeff Rickley of Thursday. Enjoy. All right. We are here now 
with Jeff Rickley. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Yes, Jeff, it's great to have you here. You know, there's a lot going on with you. You just put out your first novel this year, Someone Who Isn't Me. You have a very rich history in music, Thursday, No Devotion, United Nations. And look, we're going to cover all of that and maybe even more. But first, I want to ask you, how are you doing today? Well, I'm sick. Uh, Looks like maybe COVID time four. Uh, So I'm a little under the weather, but you know, nothing that uh, nothing that should bleed through the microphone. Oh, no. Fourth time? Yeah. It seems like everybody is getting it again, and uh, I am t- I am anticipating that for myself, which I don't want, but hey, what are we going to do, right? Yeah, I mean, my job basically most of the year is letting strangers spit in my eyes, you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> when they're singing at you, it's kind of it's like inevitable. Yeah, when shows opened back up and, you know, the people would get out on stage and wouldn't wear masks and the singer would just jump out into the crowd and get out there, I was like, they are so brave. I, I guess, but it's like, it's sort of like, what's the alternative? You know what I mean? Put up like a a plastic barricade in the front of the stage and keep away. It's, it, it would sort of kill live music in, in my opinion. I think you're right, especially in our world of music. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jeff, it's great to have you here. I just finished reading your book, oh, Someone right. Who Isn't Me. Yeah, I'm so thanks for taking the time to do that. Yeah, it was really great. You know, I had no idea what it was about when I heard it was coming out. And I, I like to go into media blind sometimes because yeah. it's just fun, I right? Agree. Like a movie or a book, just, just jump in and see what it's at. And I didn't realize it was autobiographical fiction. Mm-hmm. And once I started reading it, I just, I didn't put it down until it was done. Wow, thank you, Keith. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I I really connected with it because I went through many of the same things that you did Mm -hmm. in the same neighborhoods Mm -hmm. at the same time. So, there was just a lot of connection there, streets that you named, locations that you named, you know, I'm I'm close to, I've been close to, so... Sure, yeah, yeah. There was that whole level to it as well. So, when did you originally conceive the idea for this book? Uh, Right around the time I was getting sober, um, which now is about, oh boy, now it's about six years ago. And uh, I needed something to do to stay like on the couch, basically. You know what I mean? Um, I had a a counselor who was like, you know, if you're up and out and walking around the same neighborhood that you used to cop in, like you're going to end up high again. Like that is, that's just the way this works, you know? Um, so he said, you know, get like a PlayStation. And I got like a PlayStation, started killing zombies or whatever. And then, <laughs> and then I was like, that's only so interesting when you compare it to like a heavy drug. You know what I mean? So, um, so the book was kind of like a, a really good, it was a really good project to throw myself into. You know, I, I think I'm probably a workaholic a little bit. And so I kind of have to keep my mind busy or else, you know, I go astray. Yeah, I'm the same way. I didn't realize that once I got clean, also around six and a half years ago, uh, spring of 2017. Nice. I had interests, but I lost them all once I got addicted. And then as soon as I got clean, I picked them back up, but I didn't even realize it. Before I knew it, I was editing video, audio, doing this, doing that. And it sounds like you jumped into the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like had a, a, a little podcast for a while and stuff too. But then I realized pretty quickly that like, I'm not good at that and that I don't enjoy editing audio like very much. You know, I've done a lot of audio editing, you know, before Thursday was ever a band, I did intern in a recording studio for a long time. That's how we ended up at the studio where we did our first three records. Um, I did work on you know, things like the first My Chemical Romance record. And and so I have a lot of, um, I've done a lot of editing, especially of drums and vocals. And you'd think that maybe that'd be something that I'd be good at or I'd enjoy, but it's not the case. Um, I know how to do it. And I like, it's just one of those things. It makes me, it makes me insane because, you know, if you hear it, and you're like, oh, I'm going to take that person's um out. I'm going to take that person's like pop out. I'm going to take it. The-. And then I started, I would, you know, spend hours and hours and hours on one episode. And then at the end, I'd hear it and I'd be like, it's not much better. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it really didn't make much of a difference. So, uh, yeah, that was like not good for my whatever level of OCD I have. Right, right. I can relate. So, once you started writing this book, what's the process? How long does it take? Go through some of that for us. Yeah, I would start at... um 
you know, basically I would make a coffee and start. That's how I would start my day every day. My mind seemed the most active in the morning, which when, you know, when I was going through harder periods in my life, that was like sort of a curse. I'd wake up and my mind would be racing. So I kind of try to put that to use as like the time that I would start writing in the morning. And um, I would do anywhere between four and six hours, usually right around five, I would do a day and I do about five days of that a week. And that took me about five years. Um, I did take some classes, um, you know, did some workshops where, you know, I opened some of the sections up to criticism so that I could get some feedback and try to understand what was working, what wasn't working. And then I found an agent and she really became like my partner in the book. You know, she would scrap whole chapters and be like, I actually think the last third of the book stinks. You got to rewrite it. You know what I mean? Just like, whoa, brutal. Um, <laughs> but very, very helpful. And and I could definitely couldn't have finished the book without her. Wow. Five years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many revisions do you think you went through? Twelve. Twelve full rewrites of the book. Twelve full rewrites. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've heard it was down to like 189 pages and then up to 400 yeah. and then down again. Yeah, yeah. I, I have so much, like the middle book for people who don't know anything about the book, the middle book is sort of written as like a continuous hallucination. Um, and that one sort of doubles in a way, one long hallucination of sort of like a band memoir for Thursday in some ways. And, um, you know, a surreal one. Um, but all the kind of like dreamy more surreal stuff i had so much more you know what i mean i had like a a chapter that was like an aa meeting with like all these other singers like bruce springsteen and bon jovi there's like all new jersey singers and like, and like uh you know bon jovi kept on being like kind of like you know i'm the most famous one here like saying stuff like that and then people would kind of start <laughs> ragging on bon jovi and bruce would be like no man john's a real artist like he was like it was just like you know i went really deeply off some surreal tangents and, um, and I had a lot of fun doing it, but, you know, ultimately I had to rein it in and get it to where the plot was moving. And you, and, you know, like, I'm so glad to hear you say that you read it kind of in this one burst. Um, that was kind of where I wanted to get it by the end where it was like nothing, nothing took you so far out of it that you wanted to put it down. Yeah. Once I started reading it, I just went right through it until it was done. And it really does move at a brisk pace it's like a page turner I, you know like i could i could envision the entire movie in my head as it was happening and i couldn't wait to see what was going to happen next what did you have to do to make that happen did you have to like rewrite the whole book and redo the pace to get it right i mean uh, like what what was some of the process yeah absolutely i mean when so i first went my agent went out on submission like so she tried to sell the book um at probably i'd say like the eighth or the ninth draft and she sent it out like the week before the first COVID lockdown hit. And so we had gotten like maybe one or two answers back, maybe three. And suddenly like nobody worked in the publishing industry anymore. So everybody we had sent it to was like, you know, furloughed or fired or, you know, whatever was happening, kind of the whole media landscape fell apart in that moment. And um, the one thing that everybody said was, you know, it's beautiful, it's atmospheric, it's slow. Um, and I kept thinking like, oh, it's slow. Like it's atmospheric. Like I don't, I don't want it to be slow. You know what I mean? So, and I was like, you know, and my, my agent was like, whatever they're they're you know, if it's not what they're looking for, if it's not like, if it's not the new fuck boy, if it's not the new, like this or that, like they don't care. Like they just want the hot new thing. Like, like I wouldn't take their criticism to heart. And I was kind of like, yeah, but like more than one person said slow, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not like, yeah. That. And then I, I let my dad read it and he was like, is it supposed to be slow? <laughs> oh no. And I was like, no, okay, it's too slow. So I went back and the thing that the main thing that I changed is I changed the beginning. Um originally I had this section that happens like sort of right after the climax of the book. There's this section that's kind of like an essay talking about like death. And it's like bodies can fail in all, you know, all sorts of ways or whatever. And um that was originally the opening, like this long meditation on death. And I really like, I loved it. I thought it was like the strongest part of the book in some ways, but it is like the first 20 pages talking about like all these different ways people can die. And that yeah. was kind of like, okay, if I move that and kind of like pick up right off the start with something that I love, like music, you know what I mean? And my pursuit of music and kind of like my addiction to music and all those things, you know, it's kind of like, 
I want to get people invested in it the way I am. You know what I mean? Where you just start talking about things you love. And um, yeah, that changed a lot. Yeah, I thought the pacing was perfect. You know, I thought there was going to be a big lead up to some chaos. And I, I love reading about some chaos. But mm-hmm. pretty soon when we get into this book, you're running around Greenpoint, getting high, raising hell. And I'm like, yes, this I can relate to. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of like, there are a lot of chapters that I threw out of kind of like prelude. And at some point I realized it's like, you know, if you're telling the story of a band, which I do in the middle part a little bit, you don't mm-hmm. really have to say how the band got together because most bands get together because the people meet each other somehow. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can just kind of be like, okay, like they met and it's, you know what I mean? So I sort of like, I started having these realizations, like, you know, what part of the story you have to tell. And my agent would always say like, you don't have to tell people that you walked across the room and you sat on your butt. Like people will get, like, you can just be like, I went and sat down or whatever. You know what I mean? You can kind of skip like the extra information. Like everybody gets how you sit down. So, um, Yeah, that really helped. It was like, okay, what don't I need in here? How can I get rid of it? (laughs) The book goes into great detail about your addiction experience, which I'm curious about. So, Mm -hmm. when did it turn from medicine to misery for you? Yeah, the magic to to medicine to misery cycle. Um, I guess I was probably like 2015-ish. You know, some people probably don't know, but for a few years, I was running a record label out of an office in Greenpoint. Um, We had some great bands. I put out the first Touche Amore record. That was kind of like my first record that I put out on on Collect. Um, And I had had a lot of experience, you know, like romance and some other stuff. You know, I helped uh, Murder by Death get their start. And um, so I started doing this label because I was able to get an investor. And I had a lot of stuff going on with the label. We were partnering with a lot of other labels and distribution and um you know we were putting out uh we made the the nothing record tired of tomorrow together and then uh we made the hotelier record um and we just we were really on a roll and then our investor kind of became the most hated man in the world uh like sort of overnight he became a sensation and uh that's martin shkreli and um you know it it was quite a shock because uh i just kind of knew him as like this kid who liked Touche Amore and, and somehow had like a ton of money from some sort of <laughs> financial, you know, whatever he worked on wall street or so- something, you know, like I wasn't totally clear about everything. And it was pretty wild to watch the whole label sort of collapse around me and also sort of find out like, Oh, like, am I going to be canceled for the guy that was like writing our checks or whatever? You know what I mean? Like, this is so wild. Like I was just trying to put out records and I found somebody who was willing to pay for it, you know? Yeah. Um, it was like a really, and because I was an addict at the time and I was using like, it sort of everything turned dark, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like everything got real, real dark around then. And I started using more to combat pain than to like try and, you know, experience anything good. And, you know, as, as we all know, there's only so long the medicine works and then it stops working and it's like, oh man, this is just misery. You know, there's various degrees of feeling bad and they're all shit. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I um I'm going to speak in generalities because I still work a corporate job and I don't like them to know about this part of my life, but when uh when I turned where you turned, mm-hmm. you know, I found that things fell apart pretty quickly. Mm. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's hard to maintain that. I mean in the book you you mention uh 20,000 in credit card debt, three bundles a day, in trouble with drug dealers, like was a lot of that true? Some of that is, yeah, more than I'd like of it is true, yeah. Um, Most of the things that were changed were timeline things. Um, You know, I wanted to put a lot of these kind of like, um, I guess I'd call them inciting incidents where like something crazy happens and the character is forced to make a decision, you know, usually a bad decision in the case of this character. I put them all sort of like in a couple days. I didn't want to have to like, it's, it's a weird thing to say, but if you go back and look at the first third of the book, there's no like real, he doesn't talk about the past. It's all in the present tense. I wanted him to feel like he was trapped in like a moment that he couldn't get out of. And that includes like memory. That includes like he doesn't see a future. That's just like he's stuck right now. And um, so like I couldn't talk about like, oh, this thing had happened last week and now this is happening this week. And, you know, I wanted it all to be happening kind of in real time, like in a couple days. So that was like one of the biggest changes that's not real is I put all these events that happened over the course of a couple of years into like one week 
And then I cut out a bunch of characters because there was one draft where my agent was like, you got a lot of white guys with similar names in this book. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that is fair. That is fair. Why do I know so many guys with the same names? Um, and I kind of made a joke out of that when I introduced like the characters, like the band characters, the Thursday members, Tim, Tom and Tucker, you know, sort of like I made a little like that was kind of like a goof. So you could remember them together, the three of them, because I wanted to sort of like develop the band as like a like basically we became like each other as the as the as the band wore on, we became like one entity rather than a bunch of different characters. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what changed most of what you read in there, like the horrible circumstances. Those are, those are pretty much all real. Yeah. I, uh, I had a similar thing going on, you know, uh, I had a great paying job, but I lived with four roommates, uh, 30k credit card debt mm-hmm. over six credit cards, all that fun stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so you really did get Ibogaine treatment. I did. Yes. I went to Mexico and, and took Ibogaine. Yeah. And did the great Don DeVore from The Almighty Ink and Dagger actually recommend this to you in real life? He really did. He really did. Don's uh, Don's kind of like been my guardian angel a couple times, which is like, yo, if Don is your guardian angel, you are fucked up. Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I love Don, but he is like, you know, he's like the Andy Warhol of hardcore. Like he is like an enigmatic figure. Um and he's like sort of secretly behind a lot more than sort of anybody really realizes. Um, I think he's like one of the few true geniuses with the guitar of the last 30 years. You know, there's him, there's Kevin Shields, there's a couple guys, but he's like one of them, you know? And, um, and I was really lucky that I had lived with him for a few years so that he, you know, was looking out for these kind of esoteric cure. You know, it's like, I think if he was like, this lady knows a magic spell that'll work, I probably would have tried that too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> right, right. So it, that must have been some experience. I mean, was it uh, obviously it's uh, probably put more into narrative and uh, expounded upon in the book. But yeah, I mean, how was it? How was it going through that? A lot more chaotic. Yeah, the, more chaotic. The real life was a lot more like. So you sign up for you do sign up for a psychedelic therapist to unpack it all with you for like six months. Like you can't even get the treatment without signing up for that. And so a lot of the kind of like narrative and understanding of what was happening during the trip comes later when you talk about it. Cause so much of it is just like flashing images where you're like, wait, that could mean this or that could mean that. Like there was even a time where I was literally like, you know, there's a scene in there where I see, I, I ask the drug to show me my true self and it shows me, you know, it shows me like the, it shows me Adolf Hitler, you know, like a, a classic evil um, archetype of like, of the bad, you know? And, um, you know, there was like a month in there where I was like, so in a past life was I like, this is crazy. Like, I don't feel like I'm actually Hitler, you know? Um, (laughs) yeah. And, and then like, you know, the therapist had to be like, no, that's just sort of like your brain saying that you hate yourself. That's, that's what that is that you like, think that you're a truly bad person. Like you don't think that you're good. And I had to say like, okay, that's fair. I can see that. Like I'm, beyond hard on myself to the point where I just think like anything bad that I've ever done, it's because I'm evil. It's not because like I was hurt or in a weird position or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The book talks about the journey going through that, getting to the root of yourself and you and the other people there needed to figure out who you were. So was that it? Would I mean, did you, did you find out what the root of yourself was? Was it that you just, you didn't know yourself or you hated yourself? Um, yeah, I think that's part of it. You know, I think part of the, the the way that the book is structured, you know, the book is structured in these concentric circles that go in and in and in. And I base that on like, uh, you know, Dante's Inferno, like the different circles of hell that he goes through. Um, mm-hmm. But I structured it like the circles of a record, you know, you're going in that you're going inwards towards the center of the vinyl. And, um, and in a way, all those circles are like, the circles of the self. So you peel off like the onion of the thousand different versions of yourself that you think you are. And then what do you get in the middle of a record? The idea I had was like, you fall through the center because there is no center, you know, in, in the center, you find only again yourself, you know what I mean? In this case, it was a child, but, um, but yeah, I had this idea that like, there is no root, you know what I mean? It's just layers. <laughs> there's nothing underneath, you know, there's no like great epiphany. There's just like, you find the center of yourself and it's still just still just you, (laughs) you know? Um, I had a much darker even version of the book where there was literally nothing in the center. And, um, 
you know, when Norman who plays in Texas is the reason and now plays in Thursday, when Norman read that, he was like, dude, I think you're a Zen Buddhist. He's like, I think you are like some of this stuff that you're saying, it's like, so Zen Buddhist, like, you don't even know, you should really check it out. Like, cause he is, you know what I mean? So he's just like, I'm yeah. telling you, like the way you think about the world is like that Zen Buddhism. <laughs> so I've been a lot more interested in that since then. But, uh, but yeah, there are, there are a couple different versions of them and all of them had to do with trying to find the self, you know, this self that can save you, not the self that will kill you. Cause I think that's sort of where I was at was I, all I saw was myself and it was killing me. Right. Because, you know, the recurring imagery through the book, you can't see yourself in the reflection or you don't recognize yourself when you do see yourself. Yeah. There's a lot of that. There's a lot, I mean, you probably noticed, but there's a lot of doubling. There's a lot of like only seeing the reflection in the, in the shop windows, like not seeing, you know what I mean? Not really seeing the actual self, but seeing instead somehow seeing a double, you know, like Mm. the doppelganger. Um, and I think like in that way, you know, the David, David Lynch is always kind of doing that in his films too. You know, there's the, there's the good Dale and the bad Dale and Twin Peaks, you know, there's the version of you that's stuck in the white, the black lodge and the version you walking around out. And I think that's all like very Jungian archetypal stuff. And, um, and I find that stuff really, really fascinating. I, I've always been obsessed with it. Even in the Thursday lyrics, there's lots of stuff about doubles. So, um, wait, they had you smoke uh, DMT mm-hmm. after the Ibogaine treatment? Mm-hmm. Wow, what an intense uh, program here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could barely walk again. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, wait, we're doing that now? Like, <laughs> oh, man. And uh, But it made sense because, like, literally, like, there was stuff that I didn't include in there that happened in those three days where it was like, it was like a mutiny. It was like every single person that I was with on that. Like, I was just, like, kind of in a daze, like, I could barely move. But the people that were, like, up and walking around were kind of, like, popping off, like, I'm calling them cops to come get me you're trying to kill me you know it was like that where they were like and he was like no it's gonna be better after you smoke dmt like you'll see that's why we added it to the program people get too low after the ivy game you know because you see a lot of repressed memories you know it is very hard physically like you cannot walk for a few days afterwards and um so yeah people were like in a dark place you know what i mean they were feeling like there was one one person was suicidal, and you know it was it was really really harsh. And then after the DMT, everybody's like crying and smiling and like drinking juice and being like, "Life is beautiful." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I get why they do it. It's like you got to kick them out of that dark place. Wow. So uh, I guess it worked. Did you stay clean when you got home? Um, you, you know, yes and no. Like I think I the the sort of like physical dependency was lifted. Um, which is like a miracle, but there was a time period in the first year where I was like, I can still drink or, you know, like, I don't know. I'm not really like a fan of cocaine, but maybe I can do cocaine. You know what I mean? Like just like had some ideas that were comically bad. Um, it's like, why not? You know what I mean? Like I almost killed myself already. Like why not not be careful with this gift that I've been given of freedom from heroin, you know? Um, <laughs> so luckily by the end of that year, so that was like, I did, I began during, Donald Trump's inauguration. That's like when it takes place. And then by that Halloween that year, so like seven months later, I like was fully committed to the program and got my sobriety date and was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to, you know, whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah. I tried that too. Substitution or just drinking or just doing these drugs and then uh, just going to meetings, but not talking to anybody or doing anything. And None of that worked, and then I had to commit uh, as much as I didn't want to, and, and now here we are. I know, I know. It's like, I'm not, no, I don't want to commit. That's su- That sucks. That's for losers. And then you do it, and you're like, oh, this is so much easier and better. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like the only person I was hurting was me by not doing this. It's <laughs> so much better. Yeah, well, I don't know why it's so much bigger in the mind, but when I actually uh-huh. just did the things, it was like, oh, this really isn't that big a deal. Yeah, even when I started, like, so after I had some time... I was kind of like, I don't know. It doesn't seem that much better. Like, I'm, I don't know if I'm like really getting anything out of this. Like, I kind of like feel bummed or I feel, I feel weird. And then I heard this guy speak at a meeting. He said, you know, you got to do your first year, right? You got to do, you know, you got to get a coffee commitment. You got to get a like cleanup commitment. You got to like call three guys a day. You got to get a sponsor. You got to work the steps. And I was like, oh man, I'm like almost through my first year. I didn't do it any of that stuff. Like, I guess it's too late and I'm screwed. And he goes, the thing about your first year is you can do it anytime. You can start your first year now. And I was like, okay, okay. Like 
I can start now. I can commit fully and do everything as they say now. Like, even though I've already got like whatever, six months, nine months, whatever it was at that point, like I can go hard now, you know? So I did in 90 and 90 and did all the stuff. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, I'm not even thinking about drugs anymore. You know what I mean? It's just like, before I knew it, I was just like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny how it works like that. Uh, was the first year hard for you? Like I... Even though I was doing all the things, right? Uh, all, well, most of the things they suggest for the entire first year, I had like serious, serious cravings and even almost relapsed a couple times. And it wasn't until I guess around nine months, one year when I got the one year coin that I finally was like out of danger of immediate relapse. How was it for you? Yeah, like at a year, I remember get, like going to the meeting, getting the coin, everybody cheering and me just being like, is this it? Like, I'm still thinking about drugs right now. Like, I'm still thinking, yeah. like, what age do I get to where I'm allowed to do them again? Like, 90? If I make it to 90, do I get to do it again? Because that'll at least will give me something to look forward to. Yeah. And I still think that. <laughs> it was so dark. <laughs> I was like, damn, I don't, I don't know. And I remember, like, maybe a year and seven days or, like, a year and 10 days, I thought, wait a second, when's the last time I thought about drugs? And it was, like, two days earlier. So I had two full days of not thinking about it once. And that was the first time that I was like, oh, oh, wow. Like, I, I, could, I could be free. You know what I mean? Not just like I'm not doing them, but actually be free. Because like, you know, it's kind of like once you go down a certain amount of time with, you know, a harder drug, it sort of like does become your master. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's sort of a sad, dark thing, but. Oh yeah. Yeah, like it, like in the book, you know, your dealer, you keep running into him and he keeps trying to get in touch with you. That actually happened to me. My dealer kept trying to get in touch with me for like a year afterwards, so I must have been a fantastic customer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. Sometimes <laughs> I think about that too. I'm like, man, I was I'm that guy lost his best customer. I don't see him. I live in the same neighborhood and I don't see him at all and all I can think is like he would always tell me about all the different court cases he had open. I'm just like, man, I wonder, he's probably still not out on the street anymore. Because at some point, like some of them sounded, some of them sounded dire. I remember thinking like, oh man, I'm going to have to find another drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right where the mind goes. It's <laughs> yeah, I know. Like I wasn't like, I was like, oh, bummer for you, man. But for me, it's scary. I got, <laughs> it's going to be real bad. <laughs> I remember this one guy who helped me get like some drugs in Chinatown once. He was like, look, we have to cop like right in front of all those like police. You know what I mean? Like we we have to, it's, you know, and I was just like, that's a lot of police over there. We have to do that. Like literally in broad daylight in front of it. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, but we're not going to get arrested. And he goes, no, the only thing you have to know is if you do get arrested, tell him, tell him you want to go straight to Rikers. And I was like, Rikers. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, cause in Rikers, they'll give you, they'll give you methadone. They'll give you methadone in Rikers in the local, in the County jail, they won't, you'll just have to withdraw. He's like, it doesn't matter. Rikers sucks, but like, at least you you can you don't have to be sober for it. And like, wow. that really stuck with me. That it's like, okay, go to Ry Rikers is better. You know what I mean? Like, that's how dark it is. That you're like, I'll go to Rikers Island if it'll keep me high. You know? Uh, Great tip. Yeah, like, wow. You know, you have to be pretty far down to like choose to go to Rikers. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so uh, I loved the scene in the book where you're. You're with Don in the church, and he's painting over everything black, and you said, uh, Ink and Dagger, greatest hardcore band ever. And you referenced the time you saw them in 1997 mm. uh, at the First Unitarian Church, and I agree with you. It's certainly, it's one of my favorite bands of all time, and uh, I would say definitely my favorite heavier band of all time, mm -hmm. uh, even though they went in different directions. But mm -hmm. I bring this up because you were part of the Ink and Dagger reunion yeah. in uh, 2010, I think it was. Yeah, that was a real crazy time. Um, and a real, you know, obviously a dream come true to a certain extent. It was also sort of like a nightmare because I thought, like, rightly so. This is not me being modest, but like nobody, there is no replacing Sean. Sean, a big part, you know, a, there are two huge factors in that band. One, the sort of brilliant genius of Don DeVore making that music. And two, the danger and the intellect of Sean. So Sean McCabe, you know, real hero of mine. And I was like, I can't do that. I don't have, like, I'm not, I don't have any of what Sean had. You know what I mean? Like, he was my hero. Like, don't get me wrong, but I can't do that, you know? And so I really had to spend like a year 
not just learning the songs in a way where they they felt like a part of my brain, but you know, to where like literally when we started rehearsing, I was like, no, 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 you play this thing here and then you wait and you hit this beat and you over there, you go into this role and they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's how, you know what I mean? Like I knew their songs better than they did when we got back together. <laughs> <laughs> I had really, really like lived with it and lived in it. And, um, but the hard thing was like, how do I empty myself out of myself to make space for like the respecting of Sean and his legacy? And like one of the things that I, said to Don really early on, it's like, I don't want to say anything between songs. Like, I know that as a hardcore band, like you want somebody calling out what to do, but like, no, that's, that's Sean's mic. I will say, I will sing his words as like a vehicle for him, but I don't want to inject any of my ideas. You know what I mean? And so it was like a really like, it's one of the harder things I've ever done. And like, I'm proud of, of how much I put into it, but you know, it's still Jeff from Thursday singing for Ink and Dagger. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not the, the almighty Ink and Dagger of, of the nineties. You know what I mean? Like that was its own. I mean, I was scared when I'd be at their shows, you know, like when the lights would go out and like the strobe would come on, you never knew what was going to happen. You know, it was like, right. are they going to break pens and throw ink all over? Is it going to get in your eyes? Like, is somebody going to be like hanging off a chandelier? Like it was just chaos, you know? And I loved it. Oh, it was the best. They were, they are one of a kind. But I can tell you from an outsider perspective, I was really happy that the reunion was happening because I only saw them one time around the time uh, Fine Art of Original Sin came out. Mm -hmm. It was at the church. Mm -hmm. And I had heard all the stories and, uh, you know, a lot of the hype. And I I had never heard them before, though. And I, I watched that show. And I had a similar experience to you and where I was completely blown away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they eventually became my favorite band. I only saw them that one time. So when I heard they were playing again and that you were going to be stepping in for vocals, I was just happy because I had met you previously and I knew how much you loved, genuinely mm-hmm. loved the band. So I was like, well, this is this is the right combination. That's cool. I really I really appreciate that, Keith. I mean, I think it's it's very easy to be cynical about it. You know what I mean? Uh, what Thursday does and what like I bring to Thursday is so different that I I could understand why there's a certain segment of hardcore kids that were like, no, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) no, not him. Um, It should be Greg from Dillinger. It should be this guy. You know what I mean? I heard a lot of ideas that I was like, that's not a bad, like I would always tell Don, like, that's not a bad idea. Like maybe we should have multiple people. And he'd be like, no, it's not, it's not a clown show. It's not a circus. And I'd be like, okay. He's like, it's a band. There's a singer. I was like, okay. All right. And, um, and I got what he was saying. And the good thing is that like after that, this is hardcore that we that we did. Um, I felt like even the kind of like the skeptics were like, all right, that was actually pretty like he did a good job. You know what I mean? Like, n- I think like the spirit of the thing, it wasn't about me. It wasn't important that, it, you know what I mean? Like the crowd was there. The band was there. It like I was the guy holding the microphone. You know what I mean? Like I didn't try to make it about me. And I don't think that that mattered. I think everybody who loved that band's like went above and beyond and like kind of got to be there together. It felt, it felt like a mass or something. You know what I mean? Like it felt like this important thing. I don't know. (laughs) No, that's a, that's a perfect description. In fact, as you're describing it, I'm thinking about the show and I'm getting chills running down my spine again. So it's, I love it. It's awesome. In the book, you mentioned that you were really fucked up at the shows because you were scared and Sean was your idol and there was so much pressure. Was that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all were, I mean, that's the thing is like, I was like, it's probably going to be really different than it was in the nineties because, you know, they've all been through so much. And instead it was kind of like, um, you know, they brought out the chaos and each other being back together. <laughs> that's all I can say. It was, <laughs> there was chaos. I mean, we, I don't know if you know how that ended, but, um, we did a European tour cause they were very adamant oh, really? about, yeah, we were, they were very adamant about like the first time the band split up in Europe. Like, so we got to go along the path and end in Europe and like finish that tour. And I was like, okay, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like this thing's already (laughs) killing me. Like it's so hard, but like, let's do it. So we get out there and it's like every night who's like trying to buy like the bathtub speed from like the sound guy with a dent in his head. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was (laughs) like chaos. And then we lost a member, like literally lost a member and had to stop playing shows because we were like, he might be dead. I'm not going to like blow up anybody's spot or say who it was or anything like that. But it was like, there was a, we were a man down and we were all like, okay, we can't play the rest of the shows without him. And so we can't pick up any of the money and we can't get to like the last city all the way across the continent where our flight goes home from. 
so first we should try and find him, make sure he's not dead. And then like one day, like an Instagram notice pops up and he's like home back in the U S <laughs> and I oh was God. like, Oh God. I was like, did somebody leave and go home without telling us? And we thought they were like dead. Like it was so insane that, I mean, then that's how it ended. You know what I mean? So the second, the ending of like the reunion was totally chaotic too. Like a total, yeah, it was something else. You really, uh, you really retained the spirit of Ink and Dagger. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Painfully so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I read a story that uh, back in the day, Sean played your basement in New Brunswick where you used to have shows and he, he sold your TV. <laughs> so they weren't playing that night. Um, but he was there at the show and he had the TV in his arms and like, it was seemed to me that maybe he was taking it to go sell. And I was like, Hey, that's our TV, which obviously like it's in our living room. And he was like, Oh, and he put it down. <laughs> <laughs> so like that answer like, Oh, okay. It's yours. <laughs> like he just like, it was weird. Like I wasn't even mad. I was like, Oh, okay. Now he knows. And then I thought about it later. I was like, he definitely knew like it was plugged in, in our living room. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the the stories of him are legendary. He was like a huge idol of mine too. And I when I was young, I was I kinda tried to be a Hellraiser too, but I just didn't have it in me, so it, it didn't yeah. pan out. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. I, tr- I tried. He's one of a kind. He really was one of a kind. And like they found this wild thing right before we started rehearsing. So while we were driving around after rehearsal, because we did rehearsals in Philly, you know, like went back to the source, like did it right. So I was staying in Philly with them. And they found this CD of all these prank calls that he had made. And so we would drive around listening to Sean prank calling. And the best ones, he would prank call their drummer, Terry. Because Terry was also in Prima, the Krishna band. And so he would call up Terry's dad and say all this crazy stuff to him and be like, is Terry home? Can he come out and play? Or is he like, is he with his little blue friend? You know what I mean? Like, like kind of making fun of him for being Krishna or whatever. I mean, all of them were like, wild and offensive and like just like it made me smile to get to hear like that spirit again wow yeah he uh, i mean yeah even listening to him talk like you said you made the decision not to talk between songs when you watch those old videos and you hear the things that he says between songs it's just like it's just so captivating and like one of a kind yeah there's like they did a live performance on WKDU? Yeah, the WKDU. That's it. Yep. It's so unreal. The stuff that he says between songs, it's like, it's always like both a poetry and a joke at the same time. He was like so advanced. You know what I mean? Like he can make you laugh and make you think and also like sort of have it be like a deeper, more beautiful thing if you thought about it. I mean, he had an Aphex Twin tattoo in the hardcore scene back then. Like he was just so ahead of his time. You know what I mean? There's no shape of punk to come without Ink and Dagger. There's no, like there's so much that came from from that band. A hundred percent. So Thursday, you're yes. in this band. Yes. Yes. Now, we know that you had a meteoric rise mm. after the release of Full Collapse. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious about uh, the time around when War All the Time came out. Mm-hmm. And that's your Island Records debut. I mean, was the band happy? <laughs> was the label happy? How were things? Well, you know, so Full Collapse comes out. On, I'll give you just a little quick backstory. Full Collapse comes out on Victory. They say you know, there's no single here. Tony's like, I just don't hear it. You know, the person <laughs> fi- fired the person that signed us. Right. So like, he's kind of like, you know, you guys are, you know, whatever, maybe there's something we can do with it, but you're certainly never going to sell as many records as hate breed. And we're like, fair enough. Hate breed sells like 75,000 copies of their record on an indie. That's like unheard of. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but we're like, but we think we could do something, you know, like it's not all is not lost, you know? Yeah. So, um, It comes out, it kind of sells 700 copies, drops off, and then that's kind of it. We're playing basements and and touring like VFW halls and playing to nobody. We're playing huge shows where people walk out before we even play. It's just like, it's almost comical. Like nobody even wants to hear what we have going. So we're just kind of like, all right, well, that's weird. Then we get on the Murder City Devils tour and people start like sort of noticing us and noticing that we're doing something like a little bit different. And then we get on the Saves the Day tour and somehow at the same time, understanding the car crash starts getting played on MTV too. The band blows up like literally over the course of a month to where, you know, we're one of four on this tour. And before the end of the tour, we've booked a headlining tour two months later where we're playing bigger places even than we're opening one of four and the shows are already selling out. 
you know what I mean? So we're one of four on, on this one, but, but on the next tour, we're going to be headlining bigger places. So it was kind of like that shocking. You know what I mean? We never rose up through like the second band and then the main support band just like changed overnight. And then immediately when we get to like a hundred thousand records, victory starts like taking this really combative stance with us. Like you guys think you're too good to be on victory. Like that, that's kind of like their it, weirdly, just this weirdly like combative, which I never understood. Didn't they like start paying attention to you more too, which was probably kind of annoying, like, hey guys, how's this, how's it going? Or you know, where they weren't before? Kind of, but like in this weird way where they weren't being, they were pushing the record. You know what I mean? Like it was suddenly in stores, it was in Target, it was on the, you know, it's hard to say because like kids won't understand, like it was on like in the circular for Walmart or whatever, you know what I mean? That doesn't mean anything anymore, but CDs used to really sell. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, like, if you were in the circular, maybe it starts out and we were selling 10,000 copies of the CD a week, you know? Um, and back then, it's like, if you think about the math, it's like, those were $20 CDs in the store. They cost a dollar ten cents to make. So, you used to really make money off of music. Like, like Victory was making a killing, you know? So, that's 10000 times $19, you know what I mean? That's, that's $19,000 a week, you know, off just the CDs or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, it, it was... It was, it was pretty, it was pretty wild. Um, but they decided to take like a really combative stance with us. Like you guys are the worst. You suck. You're nothing. We've already got a band that's going to replace you. They're called taking back Sunday, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if, if they were trying to like keep our heads in check because we were having such unexpected success, but instead it kind of had to like, oh, okay, you want to fight? Let's fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? We were just like, let's do this then. Like if you guys hate us, then like we'll show you. You know, that was, yeah. that was sort of like where we went with it. And um, and so we ended up finding a loophole in our contract that said we could leave as long as we left for a major label. So we started trying to find a major label we could leave for. And um, yeah, it just went into this kind of like, let's meet with everybody. And so many of the major label guys were the worst. They were so <laughs> horrible. Like we hated them so much. And, um, you know, we were basically all but across the finish line at Island signing the contract and Gary Gersh um, meets with us for Interscope and is like, you could be the next Nirvana. And I signed Nirvana. And we were like, Whoa, <laughs> Gary Gersh. <laughs> who could resist that? Who could resist that? We tell the guy at Island that was thinking about signing us and he goes, you know, that's his only line. He told Jimmy's chicken shack. They're going to be the next Nirvana. <laughs> and I was like, Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, wait, okay, okay, okay. You know what I mean? I came back to my senses where I was like, all right, it is like a very tempting offer to be thought of that way. But like, yeah, I get it. You know what I mean? People are going to tell us what, what we want to hear, you know, like because we're legitimately selling a crazy amount of records out of nowhere. So it was a pretty wild lead into War All the Time. Going into that record, everybody loves us. I remember Lior Cohen, who uh, ran the label, telling Spin when they asked him what he thought of us he said their feet don't touch the ground and we were like wow like the guy that runs his label actually like likes us you know what i mean like he thinks we're amazing um yeah i remember around around that time War all the time was just coming out or had just come out and i was with some friends you know i i was on a part of a tour that with a band that was out with thursday and i came home and i was like me and my friends were like man they're gonna be so huge and i remember my girlfriend was like you guys say that about every band. And I was like, no, no, you don't understand. This is different. It really felt, <laughs> it really felt yeah. big and special. Yeah. I think, you know, out of the kind of basement bands, there hadn't been like a band that had necessarily cracked like the, the real like billboard like success yet. You know, when, when War All the Time came out, it was a top 10 record. It was right behind Beyonce. You know what I mean? Wow. Um, so, you know, I think it was like, 80, 70, 80,000 copies the first week. So it was like, it was, it was a big record. Um, and then, and then everybody at Island left everybody, the whole staff left for Atlantic records and universal didn't hire a new staff because obviously they felt like, well, we need to figure out who's going to run this place. You know, we gotta, we gotta bring in a good team. You know, we just lost our hit makers. But that meant we were going into our second single on this hugely successful record. We're going into war all the time and there's no one there. There's no one to answer the calls. We, somebody had told us that war all the time, the video that we spent like $250,000 on had, had gotten banned at MTV. And we were like, wow, why just for that line about carbon monoxide? Like that's insane. Like why not bleep it? You know, 
Later on, we find out that there was nobody even working at Island to bring them the video. MTV literally never got the video. So they spent $250,000 only to have nobody like courier it to the channels. You know what I mean? Like if you can think about like that level of like, there was just nobody there. Like it just all stopped. No more ads bought, no more radio spots, no more. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes behind a big record. You know, a little record, you can do word of mouth. But a big record like that, sort of pre-Twitter, pre-Facebook, pre, you know, it's just like you had to spend money to get it out there, which is okay because you made a ton of money. You know, it still sold, you know, 400,000 copies, which is like a crazy amount of records for a band that sounds like Thursday. You know what I mean? We don't sound like we belong on the radio. We, we're like a weird band. And you didn't, uh, you didn't go soft either. You maintained uh, the sound and it even amped it up at times. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, there's, there's some more aggressive elements on War all the time than there were on, on Full Collapse, mostly just because we had been on tour for two years and we were like, you know, we we're kind of like at that stage where we we're just on fire and we wanted to, we wanted to kill everybody. You know what I mean? That was kind of like the mindset. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a weird time. Uh, I was definitely depressed. I think I had spent way too much time on the road. Um, I felt like I had written this really dark album. It was like a really dark period in history. It sort of felt like the beginning. It felt like the beginning of a never ending war. I mean, you know, uh, 20 years later, it feels like that still probably was the beginning of a never ending war. Um, yeah. But yeah, it just was a, a really dark time and really, um, I was way too sensitive of a person to handle it in stride. I'll put it that way. I I can relate. I can relate. I um in Dan Ozzy's book Sellout. Yes. Uh, I remember reading about you guys were dealing with some guy at the label and he he wanted to push you in a certain direction and like maybe maybe they had these factory produced hit songs and he wanted you to go that route and have a single. Do I have that correct? <laughs> yeah, so when they finally did bring in a new, you know, label head as this guy um LA Reed who is famous he's fam- he's a hit maker legitimately like i'm not every time i tell this story it sounds like i'm bagging on the guy you know what i mean but like he's legitimately he's amazing at what he does and yeah i've heard that name yeah he's been on like one of those shows where he's like the the voice or something you know what i mean he's like people know that he's like a guy that knows his stuff so uh they bring him in and he's just done like i don't know christina aguilera and like a bunch of other big stuff and we're like we are doomed you know what I mean? We're doomed. Like this guy's never going to like us. Like there's no way. So he comes to see us at Warp Tour and you know, we kill. Cause like at that point as a live band, we were just like, we're like devastatingly good. We're so like fun to see, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, the crowd goes bananas. They sing every word. And like, I get off the stage, you know, we're steaming off the stage and we get into the dressing room where it's like air conditioned. And he just comes in and he is like, you guys are stars. Like you are star. This is it. You're going to be the biggest band in the world. Like, you know, he's just freaking out. We're like, Whoa, maybe we're not done. You know what I mean? Like he was like, this is it. Like you have the thing, you have the thing that everybody wants and nobody has. All you need is songs. And oh. we're like, okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's a kind of weird thing to say, but like, okay. Uh, and he's like, so all we got to do is get, get some people to write some stuff for you. And like, it, it's done. It's based. This is done. Like writing hits is not a problem. I, he's like, I do it every day. You know what I mean? And legitimately like he did, you know what I mean? So he's like, we just find the right fit. You hear the song, you love it. It's, it's done. You guys are like huge. And we're like, yeah, but we write our own songs. You know, we don't really work with hit makers. We're not interested in that. Yeah. And I remember him going, Oh, okay. And that was it. Like, <laughs> just like that, that was it. He was just like, okay, you're not going to do it. Like, you're not going to be a big band and you guys do not write hits. Like, you know what I mean? Like I could see in his eye that he was like, that's, that's the truth. You don't write hits. So if I don't get to write you some hits or get somebody else to write you some hits, it's just not happening. There's nothing to talk about. You know what I mean? Like that was how quick he made the decision, which is probably why he's so successful, but it was still something that like, I've only been able to look back, you know, in in the rear view and be like oh that was the moment like we were done <laughs> you know what i mean like the label <laughs> was like nah uh uh-uh. <laughs> so you know it's weird i i feel like with most bands especially now you have to do that whole system to be like a mainstream big band you know like i feel there's all those like song factories where they have people working on hits mm-hmm. and there's this collective and there's like two people at the top of it like i i feel like you have to like buy into that whole thing to have a hit song in most cases 
I think you're probably right. I think there's obviously like exceptions to the rule, but I think those yeah. exceptions where it's like, wow, and they can write is kind of like, all right, well then we'll get them to write some songs for us too. You know what I mean? It's kind of yeah. like you don't get away from the system. You just you find out what you become part of you it. You find out which part of it you are. Yeah, exactly. Like Sia used to be one of those people who wrote hits for everybody and then she's like, wait, I can I can do it for myself. Right. Like I actually have like this crazy beautiful voice that like people will freak out over. Maybe I should just you know, it's like even Rihanna tries to sound like me when she sings my songs. Like maybe I should just try this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love I I heard that interview where Sia she like the inflection she put on it like Rihanna just matched the inflection exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's once you know which ones she wrote it's it's so it's so easy. You know what I mean? You're like, "Oh yeah, Diamonds like that's clearly, you know." Um Yeah. But I I love Sia just because uh Chandelier, you know, is a, is a sober anthem, which uh, I didn't realize at the time. I don't know if you knew that, but um, no, I'm, now I'm going to have to go back and listen to it. Yeah, she, there's this part where she goes, one, two, three, one, two, three, drink. And that's because like when you get to the fourth step, everybody relapses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or or they just don't work the steps and relapse. And Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of factors. Yeah, the four is tough, so I get it, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. So you ended up putting out A City by the Light Divided. Mm-hmm on island right? Yep. but so i mean were they happy with that uh were, were, did they want to get rid of you because you weren't going to write hits with la reed like what was going on when that album was out mm, yeah so like we made that record and we made it with dave fridman which is kind of like as left field as you get you know what i mean like it's definitely not what they were looking for it was like we're like we're going to be an artsy band like you know that's basically the way that they saw it is like they've given up <laughs> you know they don't even want to try to be popular they just want to do their own thing now with our money, I think is that's the way they saw it. So yeah, we finished the record and we were having trouble picking between singles. It was either going to be counting or it was going to be running from the rain. And I thought it should be counting. I thought that was like more upbeat and work better. And our a guy thought it should be running from the rain. He was like, it's an epic. It's a, it's a ballad. We didn't get to do war all the time because of, you know, the failure of the label last time. So like now it's time for us to hit our ballad, you know? So it's basically like, well, why don't we let the hit maker guy weigh in, you know? So they were like, we'll get you a, a meeting with the head of the label, LA, and, you know, go in and talk to him. So I go in and I talk to LA and he has me into his office and is soon, he asks me about the record and I start telling him what the record's about and he opens up the paper and starts reading it between us. And I was oh. like, oh, I... I think this is like some kind of a like show me how little I matter type of moment, I think. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was like, okay, this probably doesn't bode well. And then like he put the paper down and he called his secretary and she brought the Destiny's Child singles, like number ones, I think it's called. Yeah. And he took a highlighter and started highlighting every every number one that he wrote on the record. And it was like half. <laughs> 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 it was like after. I'm sure it was just some housekeeping he had to do while I was in his office, you know. Um <laughs> but uh but you know, like I don't know. I'm sure that I I came off to him as like combative or like I was standoffish or something, but I was just kind of like I don't really know what to do with this, you know. It's not that I don't respect you, it's just it's like two different people speaking two different languages where it's like you know, it's just not a lot to say. We don't really get each other, you know? Um, There's a better way to do that. That's There's a better way to do what he's trying to do. Yeah, that's the thing. I think he just, I just don't, because I'm not like really run on ego or like one-upsmanship at all or like any of that, like I just don't respond to it. It just doesn't, it makes, it makes me want to laugh a little bit. Like it's so, it just seems so silly, you know? It's a turn off. Yeah, yeah. I just don't get it. So I was like, okay. I was like, this is going to be a good story to tell later. And then he's like, well, let's hear the two singles. And I was like, all right. So I play him Running from the Rain. And he was like, strong. It's strong. I was like, okay. And I played him Counting. And the chorus hit. And he goes, that's the one. He's like, that's a pretty good song. He's like, I don't think it's going to get you very far on the radio. But that's a pretty good song, you know? Like, that's good. I think, yeah, your writing's still improving, you know? And I was like, oh, that's nice, you know? And he's like, cool. So we do want you to stay on if you want to. And I was like, oh, really? He's like, but we will let you go if you want to go, which is usually something that a major label won't do. You know, they own your catalog and 
they want to, they'll sell it or they'll give it to a subsidiary. You know what I mean? It's like, it's their asset. They are, they've already paid for it basically. Yeah. Um, and he was like, you know, if you do another record with us, your budget's like $440,000 or whatever, which is it's a lot of money. By then we were doing records for a lot less than that. So it would have been a lot in our pockets or you can leave, you know, and I, I give you my word with a handshake, whatever you want to do, you can do. And ever since then, I've had like a lot of respect for him, you know, because I think that was a very, um, that was just, he didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? In the end, I think he was trying to make an impression on me and get me to see that he could help or whatever. You know what I mean? I don't think that he was actually coming from a, a, a bad place. It was just happening in a way that I didn't understand. So I couldn't even reason with him and say like, we just don't do that. You know what I mean? Like music is, <laughs> let me get real dumb with you right now and say like music is a spiritual pursuit for us. And so like the idea of just like doing a hit, like it's just like, it doesn't, it just doesn't matter to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, then I could like tell him all that and maybe he would have been like respect, you know, but we never got there together. And instead uh, he was very reasonable and very cool to us. And so I don't have any problem with that guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was great narrative, Jeff, because I, you told the story about the highlighting and I was like, wow, this guy sounds very questionable. And then you <laughs> you came in at the end with, you know, the handshake deal. And I was like, oh, wow, I, I like him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thursday, initial breakup around 2011. Yeah, I think it was 2012 was really when we got down into the gritty and like, we're done playing. But in 2011, we announced it like this is it. So what was going on? How were our relationships? What was going on with you? What led to the initial breakup? Well, there's still one factor that we just don't really talk about because it's like so deeply personal to one of the members and their health. Um, but it became a thing where we weren't going to be able to tour with the same people if we wanted to keep touring. And at the time, it just felt like that was such a betrayal of like this thing that had just been the same people, like really in the trenches together, like through the the highs and the lows and the pain and the pleasure. And the, you know what I mean? Like really 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 like we got to do it together or else we can't do it and we had our first practice trying to do it without the person who wasn't feeling so good and um it just i don't know it just felt really bad you know like i don't know if it would have gotten better it probably would have but as a sensitive person i was just like yo this is not working this is not working like i don't think i can do this anymore this is not it's not it this is not the thursday that like i respect and revere so much and I just like didn't want to become a parody, you know. I didn't want to become like a cash grab or a parody. I just it just, you know, it's, I feel like this is like going to be written on my uh, on my tombstone someday. But like, you know, it's just I'm, I'm too sensitive. Stuff matters too much to me to like to cheapen it, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear you say that you're too sensitive because I think I am too, and I I embrace it more. Or I, <laughs> well, sometimes I embrace it. Sometimes I try to hide it a lot. You know, I got uh -huh. voted most sensitive in my eighth grade yearbook, which wow. number one, why is that a category? Why is it a category? <laughs> and number two, I hated that <laughs> yeah. for so long. But uh, I, you know what? I think I like to think of it as uh, I just have higher perception and I can perceive yeah. uh, people's needs or wants or what they're trying to communicate, even if they're not directly communicating it more. So I, I, I'm happy to hear you just say that. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to embrace it more. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that I've learned from therapy over the years is that uh, sort of our greatest strengths and our greatest weaknesses are usually exactly the same thing. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like my whole career is probably dedicated to the fact that I'm a very sensitive person who like picks up on things. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 I am empathetic and I have a lot of care and feelings and, you know, I put that all into my work and that also makes it kind of a nightmare for some of the people in my life. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to figure out how to control it better. <laughs> no devotion. Yes. Yes. You teamed up with the remaining members of Lost Prophets yes. and uh, you guys formed No Devotion. And uh, how how do you get in touch with them? How does that conversation start? <laughs> Their manager, Karen, was a friend of mine. Um, and I saw her. I have a, friend, a very dear friend uh, named Danny Bowen who had this restaurant in New York called Mission Chinese Food, which is like it was like the best restaurant in New York for a decade. It was so good. Um, and I used to just hang, hang out there with him a lot. And I saw her there one day and we were chatting and, uh, I was basically like, Oh my God, you gotta, you gotta tell me what's going on. This is before like the full scope of the crimes had been known. Yes. And so I was like, 
did he sleep with like a 16 year old girl by accident or something? You know what I mean? Like, what did he do? Like, you got to tell me scoop, you know what I mean? And she was just like, I don't even know. Like he's an idiot. You know what I mean? Basically just like, he's been nothing but trouble for years. He's like on drugs and he's like, everybody in the band fucking hates him. You know what I mean? But he's like such a pretty boy. And like, he's like the reason they're famous. It's just like, it's just kind of a bad situation. We'll see what it is. It's probably nothing. And then like, you know, later on it comes out how bad it is. And it's like, it's worse than like literally any sane person could have imagined. And she's like, but this stuff they're writing so good. Like, would you, would you join? And I was like, are you crazy? Like, I'm not joining that shit show. Like I love Stu and Mike. They're really good people. Like I really like them, but like, I never liked Lost Profits. Like I never did. And like, this is certainly not the moment I'm going to pick to like get involved. You know what I mean? Like that's, (laughs) crazy and she's like well i'm gonna send you the songs anyway i was like you go ahead and send them and they'll sit in my email (laughs) you know what i mean like (laughs) um so whatever she she sends them and i ignore them and i go on this tour the acoustic basement tour it's like a bunch of us in a van together playing acoustic songs it's like me brian marquis um finney from movie life koji like maddie from a lost for words it's just like a bunch of people you know what i mean people come in come out transit guys come in And at one point I mentioned this story just as kind of like an anecdote, like, yeah, like blah, blah, blah. And Vinny is like, yo, Movie Life did tour with Lost Profits. Those guys are like really talented. Like they're, they like literally like the singer has bad taste and makes them play like, like boy band hardcore shit. But like, (laughs) but like the rest of those guys are like really talented. And I was like, are you serious? He's like, no, like they're fucking good. He's like, do you have the demo? And I was like, let me see. So I find it and he's like, put it on, you know? And it's like four, it's like four instrumental songs, you know? And there's a note that's like, you know, what's his face couldn't figure out what to do with these or whatever, you know? So I was like, all right. Like if they were even thinking about these being lost profit songs, like I already know I'm not going to like it. So I put it on and it's like totally, totally not what I expected. Like the first song, which we've never done anything with was like an industrial, like it sounded like a Nine Inch Nails song. It was insane. And I was like, whoa. Like, oh man. So the first song ends and Vinny just looks at me and then the second song starts and that song became like eyeshadow. And I was like, holy shit, I love this song. You know what I mean? It just keeps like, it keeps getting better and better as it goes. And at the end of the four songs, it's like totally silent and like nobody can kind of believe it. And Vinny's like, yo, do you mind if I like send them a tryout if you're not going to do this? (laughs) 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 And I was like, oh man, like maybe, maybe I should try like see if my voice fits on any of this so i like at the next hotel i sang uh a demo for a song that became um addition on the record and like they were like cool like it sounds good like when do you want to meet up and i was like oh i don't know and karen's like just go meet them they're such nice guys and i was like no i, I know mike and Stu. they're great like no you got to meet the rest and they're so nice so they fly me out and literally as soon as they picked me up, they took me to the studio and we're like, here's three, three more songs. Let's do them right now. And like, they were all watching and I was like, what? This is not like, you know what I mean? It just kind of all happened. And they were like, still totally in denial. You know what I mean? Like they kind of were like, no, it's okay. He was always an asshole. We're glad he's gone. Like that fucking sucks. Like it'll, it'll be okay. You know? Yeah. And I was like, I don't know. Like it's, it's pretty bad. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's really yeah. bad. Like the crimes are like really bad. Like, and it took them a while. You know what I mean? Like, like it, it was really like when he went to trial, I think, and the stuff that people were saying in the courtroom started coming out and the stuff that he was saying in the courtroom were coming out. It was like, we were already, we had gone down the road of like the record was coming out. You know what I mean? And, or at least the single was coming out. Like we were basically already on the public stage and it was just like, suddenly these guys started to like kind of break like 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 their like their psyche couldn't handle what they were learning you know and they were trying to hold it together they were such troopers but it was like it was so fucked up it was so it was so like bad (laughs) you know what i mean and like i'd see one of the guys and you have his hand bandaged up and i'd be like what happened and be like oh i broke all our platinum record plaques you know i punched out all the glass and threw them in the garbage because like i don't want to have anything to do with that ever again you know stuff like that where it's like man that's your life's work you know what i mean yeah so i really felt for those guys and i really like no division no devotion was like such a mission to like try and give them a second life you know but i think there's a couple things i'd 
I would have done different in hindsight. I would have waited a little longer, I think, and just because it was so fast. And also, like, I couldn't have known. But, you know, the stuff with Martin um, came out and sort of collapsed the label, like, the week that our debut record came out. Yeah, that's a, that was, like, a historically just awful week. You yeah. The stuff with Martin came out, the band started leaving, you had to fold, collect, and you got mugged yeah. and drugged. While yeah. trying to buy heroin in Germany the first night of the tour, yes. <laughs> Turns out you shouldn't try to do that. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know the uh, the addict in me is curious. Did did you ever end up getting any drugs? I did, but not not what I was looking for. You know what I mean? Like oh, it, yeah. it it was very like it was a really it was intense. Like people's reaction to me asking for that in Germany was like, I thought you wanted drugs. Like, what are you talking about, heroin? You know what I mean? (laughs) I was like, wow, do they not do do heroin in Germany? This is so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. They were like, like I seriously offended a few drug dealers. (laughs) Isn't it funny how even in drug circles, once you mention that, people are like, whoa, whoa, buddy, what are you talking about? Yeah, they really are. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Were you ever in a foreign city, you know, US or abroad where where you did get the drugs you were looking for. I've managed to do that once or twice and it's the best feeling. It really is. Um, I was, I used to, I used to um, unwisely uh, fly with it sometimes and go through customs with it somehow. Um, Me too. So so (laughs) stupidly, but um, yeah. Oh man, I'm a lucky guy that I got through that. Yeah. Came out the other side. Yeah. Big time. So I was going to ask, how did you get through that week? Because the label folds and you know, there's all this stuff going on, but you're on heroin. So when you're on heroin, you can get through anything pretty much as long as you have more heroin. Yeah. But when I didn't have it, it was like the, that whole next week, I kept being like, send me home, like, get me a ticket, send me home. You know what I mean? Like after they bailed me out or whatever, I don't know how they got me out. Actually, maybe they bailed me out. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But I got out of the German. I don't know what it was. Like I started in the hospital and then they let me quote unquote wait in the cell for my friends. Um, and, and the crazy, the German, one of the German cops said something so, so bleak to me. And I like to think that it was like a translation thing, but I was like, where are my, where are my friends? You know? And he said, time is your only friend now. Well, <laughs> when you're sitting alone <laughs> in a cell, it's kind of like, damn, <laughs> that's fucking hardcore. Time's my only friend. That's profound. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I kept on asking them to send me home. And, and so they're like, no, nah, you got this. So they were like, putting me on stage every night. And I was just like withdrawing like a bastard. And also feeling like, you know, I got like lightly beat up in the whole ensuing melee. And uh, yeah, so I just felt terrible. And I don't know how I made it through that tour. But uh, yeah. So what happened? You had to come home and just start shutting down the label like did you have to talk to martin like what did you have to do i had to talk to everybody i had to talk and the main thing was i had to talk to all the bands and try to be like this this is okay i know and luckily i had um signed a deal like back then that every band owned their master so like if they ever wanted (coughs) to leave they could just take their master and go like they'd still owned it and that my whole pitch which like to his credit martin went for is that i was like we need to make a label that's so good that nobody will ever screw us over because the, they can't find a better label. Yeah. That was my whole idea. It was like, just make it so good that nobody leaves. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Who knows if it would have worked, but you know, it was a kind of utopian idea and, um, and it saved all those bands because uh, when the label collapsed, they could just be like, I'm going and I'm taking this record. See ya. Well, Permanence went on to win the Kerrang album of the year. Yeah. That year. It right. Did, yeah. So that must have felt good. It did. It felt good. Um, being at that ceremony was really interesting, you know, because we uh, Thursday had toured with the Deftones. So we got to the table next to them and kind of I got to catch up with Gino and, and the guys a little bit. And, um, you know, everybody was pretty shocked when we won because I think like that we were definitely the underdog, you know, um, and the, the record was out of print by then. So it was kind of like, is this a first or an out of print record wins album of the year? um i'm still really proud of that record and i love the second no devotion record too but um yeah it's been a very uphill battle with that band no oblivion just came out last year in 2022 and to everyone listening make sure you check it out and permanence too everything i really like it because you know it's it's different from thursday and the heavier stuff and the more post-hardcore stuff and i'm sure it's exciting for you jeff because you get to do something a little differently right oh yeah yeah it's it's so different from thursday and you know, uh, 
I get to flex like kind of my natural singing range a little more. Um, with Thursday, I, I sing in a sort of higher, more, um, you know, more passionate, more frantic range, you know, which earned me the nickname tone Jeff. Cause people are like, he doesn't, you know, he's tone deaf. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but with no devotion, you know, it's like, I can, I can sort of, uh, sing in my natural range, which is, is quite lovely for me. I really enjoy it. When did you start talking to the guys about recording the new record? When does that come about? Oh, like around the same time I started the book. So uh-huh. like we worked on it for a few years. Um, yeah, it was strange. Like we had, we had the record basically finished. Like, I guess you would call it a demo at the time. I mean, it's the same, basically all the same recordings that ended up on the record, but it was sort of not finished. And I was like, let's finish this thing up and put it out, you know? And then COVID happened. And, uh, one of, you know, one of the band members still was still dealing with the trauma from everything that happened with the singer of their old band and basically had like a breakdown again. And, um, you know, I understand why it's like, it's a heavy thing to go through. So yeah, it took us a couple extra years to get to across the finish line. It feels like it was like the last, you know, when you see the marathon runners who get like a hundred feet from the the finish line and all of a sudden their legs don't work anymore and they're like shitting themselves on the side of it. That was kind of like what we were like with this record. It was like, we were so (laughs) close and, uh, and we just couldn't get it across the finish line. So we had to take a little extra time with it. Sorry, the run is kicking up. Oh no, that's okay. Oh yeah. I see. I, I forgot you had COVID and you're, you're here having this long conversation with me. Don't, don't worry. We're we're almost at the finish line, so your legs will not give out and you will not be shitting yourself. I, we'll see. I think. I think. <laughs> Is the curse lifted from the band or do we not know yet? Because I know you tried to play some gigs. You had a string of bad luck. There was more COVID. Yeah. There was a hotel fire. One of the band members had a family emergency and had to leave the tour. Yeah. Was that the last time you guys were together? Yeah, 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 it was. It was. It was really heavy. I, I'd like to believe that the the end of this calendar year, the curse lifts. That's what I'd like to believe. We, we'll find out. It has to, because we have to get out there and play these songs, right? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's the dream. <laughs> United Nations. Yes. 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 Now, uh, as legend has it, uh-huh. uh, the initial lineup had a lot of heavy hitters. Yes. And uh, everyone was under contract except you currently, right? Yeah. I mean, how much of this stuff, looking back, I'm like, how much of that was even real? Is that true? Yeah. Maybe it's just part of the lore. And there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting lore with this band that I didn't know about that I, I want to get into. But yeah, uh, yeah who, who was initially you and Daryl from Glassjaw? Who was it? Yeah, though he didn't end up on much of the first record. He is on it, but not on, not on all of it because he was having some stomach trouble when we were recording and wasn't able to finish with us. Um, but also, uh, let's see, who else is on it? Uh, Jonah um, Bayer, who's Vanessa Bayer from SNL's little brother. Older brother, older, older brother, and also a, a great music writer. Um, ben from Converge was playing drums. Um, you know, one of the, the truly great drummers of of our hardcore generation. The you know really, it's like what can you say about Ben from Converge? Like, oh my god, <laughs> um, you can't say enough good things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, incredible. Um, I don't remember who else played on the first record. I know that when we started playing it live, Jim Carroll from Hope Conspiracy and everything. And uh, I think he's in, I think he's an American nightmare now, maybe I'm not sure if he still is, but he was an American nightmare. He was playing bass with us. Lucas Previn um, was also playing guitar with us uh, for a time. Uh, Ryan Bland, the singer of ache was also with us for some of those shows, early shows. Um, so it was kind of like, it was kind of like a changing lineup a lot. Um, and then when we finished doing shows for uh, never mind the bombings, then Ben and Jim left and we got David and Zach from Pianos Become the Teeth. And that was like really kind of like the final form of the band. Um, and we did the next four years and then they did a song without me called Stairway to Mar-a-Lago with, uh, with Daryl. I read an interesting story. Uh, you were a fan of the artist James Cauty. Yes. You tracked him down. You wanted him to do the artwork, right? Yeah. But he did it. Well, he said, I would do, I'll do it, but you have to say you stole it from me because I don't want to end up in jail again. <laughs> again, exactly. Because he had already gone to jail for his art. <laughs> he just like violates a lot of different copyright stuff or what is yeah, it? Yeah, the, the jail incident, I believe, was because his early works, he, he was known for uh, uh, the queen. He would paint a gas mask on her 
and he would do it on the stamps and then he would send the stamps through the mail. So that was technically mail fraud. Then I believe that he got out of that eventually by, by actually designing a whole bunch of their stamps for the Royal Mail. Um, <laughs> so it was like a trade. And then he got in trouble again because he won some huge grant. I think it was like a million pounds and he burned it on the steps of parliament. I mean, he's like a real radical, this guy, you know what I mean? He doesn't believe in property. He's like a true crass style anarchist, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. I heard about that money burning mm-hmm. thing before. Yeah. yeah. I mean, his old band, the KLF were sort of n- n- notorious too. They went to like a MTV music awards thing and like threw out dead lambs and like, and had fake machine guns and shot into the audience. Oh my like, God. yeah, they've done some real wild stunts <laughs> that like you could not get away with today. You know what I mean? No, they would have gotten killed today. <laughs> yeah, they would have been sniped. See you later. Um, but yeah, he did the art for the first record and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty controversial. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, you were poised for greatness with United Nations, right? It shot up to the top of some list on MySpace and yeah, Hot yeah. Topic bought 20,000 copies uh-huh. to sell and we're, we're poised to do this thing. And then they called you and said, we can't use this record. We can't, you know, the layout, it, copyright infringements, oh, we yeah. can't use it, right? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, the cover of the album was The Beatles on Fire from Abbey Road. <laughs> and then inside it had Bugs Bunny wearing a suicide bomber vest. Uh, See, that sounds cool to me. Yeah, no, to me, I was like, <laughs> hell yeah. Um, but they were not having it. And they had to, because of a legal loophole that prevents them returning um, what would be considered what, like like stolen IP, um, they're not allowed to give it back to us because we might sell it again fraudulently. They had to destroy it. So they sent us these pictures of like a, a steamroller going over all the records. It was kind of like, it was kind of perverse, but like it sort of fit into the whole artwork. You know what I mean? It like just felt like, yeah, this is this is right. See, I, I just got an idea. I know it's way too late, but <laughs> take that yeah. picture of the steamroller rolling over the records and make that the, the layout. I know that should be the cover. I know I got to see if I can get that picture because that's kind of what we did. Like, so the next thing that we put out, because then we found out we were being sued by the actual United Nations. And we were like, whoa, like the record, record layout is like not the biggest problem here. You know what I mean? Like this is unreal. So we got a cease and desist from them and we decided like, why don't we go record three songs? We'll sell them at shows wrapped in copies of the cease and desist letter. You know, just really push it over the top, like really get them mad, you know? That's so cool. <laughs> I, I, when I read that, I was like, fuck yeah. Like that's something Sean and Ink and Dagger would do. Yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah, you got to channel that a little bit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what's the status with that band? Will you play again one day or is it just uh, inactive right now? I hope so. I hope we play again. You know, like we had this idea like, oh, we did the next four years. We should, you know, after four years is up, we should do another. And then I was like, wow, we really missed that already. <laughs> you know, what I mean? It's been way more than four years. So, um, but yeah, no, we've been, we've been talking. We're all still in, in touch and we're friends and, uh, you know, a lot of life has happened in between, but, um, but yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love the return of the United Nations. That'd be great. Especially since like musically that band is so, it's so easy. It's like, it's like we write, we write the songs in about as much time as it takes to play them, you know? So like, I, I do enjoy that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. It just happens and then it's done and we're like, good. Like nobody's ever like that one part kind of sucks. Like nobody ever does that. It's like, yep. That's the worst part of being in a band is all the discussions and arrangements and all that stuff. So if you can cut that part out, that's great. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And nobody is ever like, is it good enough? It's like, yeah, it's fine. (laughs) Yeah. It's fast. It's aggressive. It's fun. It's it's good. Yeah. Is it, is is it over quick if it's not good? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's recap. Now, Someone Who Isn't Me, your debut novel, is out now on Rose Books. Now, the first pressing is sold out, but I'm telling everybody out there, you know, there's resellers out there who have some in stock. You can get it. You can get it if you search on the internet. And Jeff, we want everybody to purchase the book and read it, yes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a super DIY punk press. Um, Chelsea Hodson put it out. And uh, her husband also, she's an amazing writer and she wanted to start a press that was super punk. And like, we are not using Amazon. We are not using Kindle. We are not, you know what I mean? Like we're really trying to keep it like grassroots. Um, We're not using a major distributor. So it's like every book that you buy really helps the press and helps the next book that's coming out. And a lot of the business model is taken from Chelsea's husband's label, which is Youth Attack Records. Uh, Her husband is Mark, who sang for a band called Charles Bronson. 
And, oh. um, yeah. So we're keeping it really like the DIY spirit is alive in, in indie publishing right now. I love that. I love that. No Devotion released a new record last year, No Oblivion. We want everybody to check that out, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, come on. I'm so proud of it. So yeah, please do. It's great. It's great. I love it. And uh, any any shows planned for the future? Any discussion yeah. or anything? Yeah, Thursday's out. So Thursday's out on tour, uh, you know, January, February. We're doing our 20th anniversary uh, tour for the record War All the Time. We're bringing our friends and rival schools with us. And, uh, and the opening band is a band called Many Eyes, which is Keith Buckley from Every Time I Die's new band. So I think it's a really cool lineup and a uh, little something for everybody. You know? What a tour. Wow. Yeah. New Thursday music. Now, we haven't had <laughs> a new record since 2011. And I, Long time now. That is the burning question. Have we, have we introduced a new riff? Have we worked on a new song? What's going on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've done some. I mean, we've, we've jammed so many times, but the, the whole band agrees. Like, if it's not as good or better than anything we've ever done, then it's, like, not really worth putting out. You know what I mean? Like, nobody's trying to, like, reunion mania, emo revival, let's make some money. Nobody wants to do that. It's, like, either it's amazing and it holds up, or it's just, like, it's never going to see the light of day. So that's kind of where we're at right now is we, we keep jamming, but nothing nothing out there yet. So it gives you an idea where we're at. So we're jamming, but we don't have a song that's as good or better than anything else yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's bound to happen. Look at Quicksand. They came back. They've got some hits on those new records. I love Quicksand. They're they're they're, the best. they're greatest of all time for me. I'm I'm a fan. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, Jeff, uh I really appreciate you coming on the show. I I've been listening to you for a long time. I love everything you do and I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Keith, it's been such a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. And uh yeah, hope I see you soon. And there you have it, Jeff Rickley. Wow. Excellent, excellent conversation and a fantastic way to start off this new year on the show. First, let me say this. I really recommend his new novel, Someone Who Isn't Me. I really love the concepts of uh, different dimensions, dream worlds, liminal space, all that kind of stuff. I dig it. I dig it. It's something that interests me. So in the book, He's just going through this major ibogaine trip in his mind and getting to the root of his issues. And it's like this whole adventure within his mind. And that takes up a good portion of the book. And like I told him, you know, he's running around in neighborhoods I ran around in and getting into trouble and figuring things out. And I could really relate to it. It's a really great book. Pick it up, check it out. And listen, Thursday are just a a one-of-a-kind once in a lifetime band. I still remember just out of nowhere, everyone's like, you got to see Thursday. You got to see Thursday. It's this great band. And Full Collapse was out. It was a very exciting time. And I have some personal history because I was out on a tour with them in 2003, right before War All the Time came out. Or maybe it had already come out. I can't remember. But it was really exciting to see it firsthand and talk to the guys a little bit. And and look, Jeff has just done so much. No Devotion, United Nations. I know that Jeff loves Ink and Dagger just as much, if not more, than I do. And getting to hear the inside scoop about the reunion uh, was really awesome for me. So, fantastic conversation. You know, when I was editing the conversation, I went back and watched the band video for War All the Time that Jeff talked about. It's on YouTube. And it just brought me back to 20 years ago, out being on that tour, this record being new. And I got kind of sad thinking about everything. I was like, man, where did all the time go? How did we get so old? I used to be so young. The world used to be so big. Everything used to seem so strange and wonderful. And it's not really like that anymore. But I'm also happy because, well, one, I'm not young and stupid and out of control and broke and addicted to drugs anymore. So those are all good things. And you know what? I'm just happy that I have those memories and I got to go on those tours and I got to experience everything that I did. And I'm happy where I'm at now too. And I'm happy that Jeff came on the show. 
So thank you so much. So thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on the show. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? So right now it's New Year's Eve as I record this. And you know what? My only plan for tonight is to play Destiny 2 with a friend later. I recently got into that game. We were looking for a multiplayer game to play. And it's a lot of fun. This has been my only day off for the entire vacation because there's been stuff to do every day. A lot of big interviews, a lot of prep for the interviews, a lot of recording, a lot of editing, a lot of stuff in my life to do outside. So it's nice to have a relatively quiet day, which is today, to relax, play some games, mess around online, and be here with you to record this show. Do we have any resolutions? What's your resolution? Mine is that I want to get my new band launched, right? We've been working on music. We've been recording music. I want to get our first release out there this year and play as many shows as I can in 2024. And it's going to be very hard, but I also want to double the podcast audience again. We doubled last year. I want to double it again this year. And if our calendar holds up, we just might be able to do that because the first two months of the show are looking insane right now. And I'm very, very excited. Also, since the last time I checked in, there's been a lot going on. I caught Piebald in Brooklyn a couple weeks ago at the Meadows. And that was an awesome gig. This band, Weekend Friends, opened. They're like an alt-punk, post-hardcore type band from Portland, Maine. And I really enjoyed them. And Piebald. Piebald is just classic. Super catchy. All those songs got stuck in my head again after seeing them. Long Nights, that's the jam. And American Hearts, you can't beat American Hearts. But they played a new song. They played some of the Christmas songs. Great varied set list. Really awesome to see them again. Haven't seen them since Furnace Fest 2021. And shout out to Dana Bolin for getting me into the show. You recognize him as the man running around and hitting the cowbell on the stage while they're playing. And of course, he is host of Two Week Notice Podcast. So if you haven't checked out his podcast, do it. He's got a lot of great guests on there, and it's a great show. And then last night in Manhattan, I saw This Will Destroy You. Now, this was the 10-year anniversary of their record, Tunnel Blanket. And I'll never forget the first time I saw them when they played songs from this record, okay? It was like 2011. The last time I saw them was around 2008, 2009, something in there. They were mostly playing material from the 2007 self-titled record, right? Now, this is where they started to change and get like moodier and darker and a little heavier. And But it was still kind of in the post-rock area that we expect from This Will Destroy You. So then I see them again in 2011, and I have no idea what to expect. I'm expecting the stuff I've heard and the This Will Destroy You that I know. And I think they opened the show with Black Dunes. And we were just floored. It was insane. It was just incredibly heavy and and not what we were expecting from the band. I'll never forget that show. So when I saw they were playing a 10-year anniversary show for this record, I had to go. And they had a full orchestra, violin players, harp, three guitar players. They had George Clark from Deaf Heaven on guest vocals. I mean, come on. It was insane. Insane. Fantastic show. Really great way to close out 2023, my last show of the year. And Christopher Tignor opened the show. He was one of the guys playing violin with the band. And I think maybe he played on the record too. Uh, he was great too. He would play violin and loop it and there would be these drum beats and then he would play triangles and loop in violin. I was captivated the whole time. It was really good. Really good. So let's move into the new scene community hour. Now at that piebald show that I told you about, I ran into a guy named Nick who recognized me from the show. And he actually emailed me and Tommy a while ago, and I'm going to read that email for you now. Nick says, Keith and Tommy, sup guys, I'm Nick, and I've been a longtime listener of the Northeast Scene New Scene Podcast. I've been meaning to write in for a while because I grew up in Connecticut in the early 2000s, going to metal hardcore shows 
and This Day Forward and A Life Once Lost were two bands I idolized as a teenager. I actually recall seeing both of those bands play together at a small karate school in Waterbury, Connecticut in 2002. The real reason I'm writing in is that, like Keith, I became enamored by post-rock at a certain point in my life, and I now play in a post-rock band. I made the journey from Chugs to Endless Reverb. Ah, yes, that is the path. So Nick is in a band called Wes Meets West. It's a post-rock band. They're actually playing post-festival this year, later this year. That's a great festival, so cool to see them on that. And uh, check them out. I'm going to add a track of theirs to the New Scene 2024 Spotify playlist. So you can check them out there. You can check out all of our guests. And you can check out all of my recommendations. Nick also sent a video that he shot a long time ago of A Life Once Lost playing The Wicked Will Rot way back in 2004. And it's an awesome video. If you search A Life Once Lost... The Wicked Will Rot 82404. Nick's YouTube account is Food for Crows. Check it out. It's a good throwback. We were just talking about a life once lost in my group text. And uh, I think the consensus was Hunter is the overall strongest album. That's a classic. I still go back and listen to that one from time to time. So Nick, very nice to meet you. And thanks for writing. And listen, just uh, as a reminder, everybody, I really need to get us over 200 reviews on Apple Podcasts. So if you listen on Apple Podcasts, even if you don't, if you have an iPhone, look for the podcast app, search the new scene, scroll down a little bit, just hit the five star button. And if you write a review, I'll read it during this section of the show right here. Thank you, everybody, for your continued support of the show. We doubled our audience again in 2023. And like I mentioned earlier, I want to do it again this year. All right. So that brings us to the end of the show. And I have another music recommendation for you here. The band Minor Movements. The song Where You're Looking From. It's from their 2019 record Bloom. I have this little tradition on New Year's Eve where I go down to the waterfront in Williamsburg And I sit there and I listen to this song and I think about the year or whatever else is going on. And then I come home. And this whole record is fantastic. So make sure you check it out. I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So thanks everybody for listening. And until next time.